So, good afternoon and welcome to the presentation of my artistic research, Restructuring Hierarchy Within and Between Jazz and Classical Orchestras. We have just watched a video with short excerpts of the performance that happened last week here in Graz of this piece entitled Eight Works Against Racism and Poverty, written for Jazz Symphonic Orchestra. Developing this work and achieving these results involved a four-year intertwined process of artistic experiment experimentation and social research. And now, in the next 30 minutes, I will guide you through some of phases of my work, clarifying methods, problems, and findings. Before starting this artistic research journey with you all, I would like to say a big thank you to Professor Dennis Peters, to the faculty of the artistic doctoral school, and also to my advisors, André Döring, Ed Partica, Christopher, and Heine Temple for all the support you gave me during the last years, and also to the musicians who were part of the project, and also to the financial help from Lunch Tiamark, Sony Five Festival, and the Kunstuni Graz. I would like to start relating some background of this project as a result of my personal experience. In 2012, after my studies in Brazil, I moved to Graz with the goal of writing music for a big band. This curiosity and love for large ensembles started to grow, and in 2015, I had a remarkable experience conducting a jazz symphonic orchestra, including jazz and classical musicians. While on stage rehearsing and performing, I had a strong feeling of fulfillment. However, I was very irritated by an invisible wall that was created between the jazz and the classical musicians. It was as if a separation was created and reinforced by the music itself and by our creative process. I was annoyed by the hierarchical organization and also by the lack of interaction and lack of collaboration and with this unresolved feeling, I started thinking about how this could be different. The backbone of this presentation will be the discussion of the practical process conduct conducted with different large ensembles, where hypotheses and ideas were put into practice. Besides the artistic practice itself, ethnography and qualitative research supported the methodology and through analysis of the artistic results and collected data, I aimed to answer to the question, how can we establish communication between so-called jazz and classical musicians, empowering them to engage in collaboration in large ensembles, uh, such as jazz symphonic orchestra? To answer this question, my artistic research focused on the creation of music for jazz symphonic orchestra, questioning the established hierarchies and frictions between jazz, classically trained musicians, conductor, composer, and notated music. This question is relevant artistic, artistically and socially because it asks if our traditional models and approach to making music with large ensembles are appropriate to our time or if they need revising. Although the debate about leadership and relational process has been very present in recent years, I would argue that the structures themselves have changed very little in the field of large jazz ensembles. We can say that orchestras and big bands still make use of these hierarchical organization models inherited from the romantic classical orchestra and military bands, uh, respectively, where leadership is built on a vertical top-down model and are rarely questioned. So this presentation will be, will be divided in research objects, methodology, case study one, case study two, results, and conclusion. So, the Jazz Symphonic Orchestras appeared in the 20th century as a mix of classical orchestras and big bands. Uh, they were hybrid orchestras and played a major role in the movie industry. Since they appeared, its social context has changed drastically. The musicians of today have generally a broader education, are equipped with better instruments, and at the same time, barriers between musical genres are gradually dissolving. I believe that using the Jazz Symphonic Orchestra 
as a laboratory to research the aesthetic and social possibilities of alternative hierarchy and leadership models can help us to contribute to new ideas in the field of chess composition, ideas that can resonate with our contemporary world and its challenges. Artistic research projects tend to be mostly interdisciplinary and combine methodologies from different fields during the research. It involved uh, two distinct parts in my case, preliminary and main research, which have distinct characteristics and functions in the research. The preliminary phase included archival research at the Metropole Orchestra and at Orquestra Jazz Sinfonica de São Paulo in Brazil, which gave birth to an ethnographic work focusing on my experiences with both orchestras, which I will not address today, unfortunately, due to time limitations. The main research is the focus of this presentation and involved three intensive, intensive artistic experiences, which were documented, reported, and reflected in detail in my dissertation. Besides my work as composer, during the last four years, I was immersed in this work as researcher, instrumentalist, arranger, conductor, and even manager. The musician's perspective was also fundamental to my reflections during this research, and in addition to audio and video documentation of rehearsals and recordings, I performed qualitative research in form of semi-structured interviews with selected musicians. This research also resulted in the following outcome. A published article contribution at the Six Rhythm Changes Conference, the composition of a program for a jazz symphonic orchestra, the production of an album with excerpts of my composition work, and 80 compositions for large ensemble. In my first practical case study, I worked with a jazz nonet and a string orchestra. The string orchestra traditionally has the concert master as a boss who leads the string section and takes care of interpretative decisions. Involving improvisation in my compositions introduced, introduced a basic distinction. When the string orchestra performs improvised music, either collective or individually, different string players assume different functions simultaneously. How should the scores and individual parts be notated in this scenario? How can collective improvisation be coordinated with so many string players? As we see in the score excerpt, my solution was to have each section of the string orchestra divided in two staves, the soloist and the section. This kind of notation helped me to imagine and plan different improvisation settings in advance. And now we can hear how it sounded in 2018. The fact that there was an additional part plus the autonomy the strings were given during the rehearsals gave the players the chance to structure the sections as they saw fit. As a result, different hierarchies emerged than would normally take hold in a traditional string sections. Not only was the soloist chosen collectively, they also shared the role of a leader, what is a rare occurrence in the classical environment. Although recording is a routine element of jazz practice, it is still an art full of mysteries and constantly developing and changing according to new technologies and necessities. And even with 18 strings arranged in a circle during the recording, the strings were still much softer than horns and drums, making interaction between players very complicated. Although musicians could hear the strings with support of monitors, the string soloists were still almost inaudible, and no solution at this problem, uh, for this problem was found at this time. This aspect revealed the power relation intrinsic in the interaction between string players with horns, drums, and electric instruments, 
And this became explicit when the bass clarinet player discussed his experience improvising with strings in this piece. Although this improvisation setting was conceived as a collective interaction between bass clarinet and a group of string players, the woodwind player automatically took the initiative to the improvisation, becoming the featured soloist. I do not judge his decision and doubt that other musicians would have approached the situation differently. However, it's a clear example of how a volume discrepancy between instruments can interfere in the group dynamic. By listening and watching to the video, it's clear that he leads the section not only because of his attitude, but also because of the volume, which automatically turns him into the lead voice. As we heard, some string players made efforts to react or bring new elements to the inter interaction, but the bass clarinet was still the dominant instrument. So involving the string orchestra in improvisation settings was essential to question the hierarchy and explore the potential that the strings can have in jazz symphonic orchestra contexts. One violin player commented in interview, This is very interesting for me because although the violinist pointed out the concert master didn't speak for the strings, this can also be seen in a positive light. It's possible that the composition and rehearsal strategies open new possibilities in terms of social interactions and power relations in the string section. The statement, there were several players speaking up for certain passages, clearly implies that the individual players were actively thinking for themselves and offering input on the music. As we saw, different players took the role of concert master in various moments, a sign of increased autonomy that is essential to shared leadership, for example. So in 2018, I started then composing new pieces as a reflective continuation of this case study one, which began with a more concrete objective. Look for a notation method in order to make the musical score more accessible to the musicians thus sharing information which generally held only by the conductor. My main goal in terms of notation was to adapt the traditional scoring for large ensemble jazz compositions, resulting in individual parts supporting increased autonomy for the performers. The quantity of predetermined elements in musical notation can vary drastically depending on music context, tradition, etc. And using notation to give more autonomy to the musicians in large ensemble is a complex undertaking. I took particular inspiration from small jazz ensemble practice in order to find alternatives. In general, small ensembles in jazz work from a lead sheet or simply play by heart. And in this case, I aimed to incorporate the idea of lead sheet as a concept to write music for a large ensemble. In order to share the knowledge of the score with the musicians, each individual part showed harmonic reductions, as you see marked here, in form of chord symbols, and also melodic passages played by other instruments. Although cue notes are common in classical orchestra parts, they are usually supplied for the purpose of orientation, which was not the intention here. In addition to better orientation, a horn player even commented that the harmonic information resulted in better understanding of his lines in relation to harmony, also affecting positively the intonation. Although macroscopic structures of the pieces remained decomposed, a high degree of unpredictability was present in every performance. And a good example of these notations directly result is the introduction of a piece called Naked Tree.
I think the notation by itself has no direct impact on the process of making music because musicians, both jazz and classically trained, are used to play what is notated in their parts and to follow the instructions of a conductor. To explore the potential of the notation system described, the rehearsals had to incorporate also novel strategies. In order to support the engagement of the musicians in collaborating with each other, it seemed necessary to explain how the notation system should be interpreted. At the beginning of our first rehearsal, I told, told the musicians what the compositions were about and how to think about this notation. The behavior of both jazz and classical musicians is not likely to change automatically simply by using more open notation and saying you have more freedom. My experience in this case study showed it had to be explicitly said and reemphasized at every rehearsal. In addition, I had to support this through my actions as conductor, which included one, only conducting when necessary, also not remaining in front of the band the whole time, and most important, trusting the musician's instincts before giving them feedback. So after two case studies, it became clear that less vertical hierarchical relations in large jazz ensembles are possible and were achieved through some modifications in the process of making music. Alternative notation methods sharing the information in the score, trusted based rehearsal methods giving more autonomy to the musicians, and alternative physical setup and the application of technology in order to create opti uh, optimal acoustic situations. The rigorous analysis of interviews with 13 participants of both case studies revealed that the changes in these areas stimulated qualitative interaction and collaboration in the large ensemble experience. After Three years of preparation based on artistic work plus qualitative scientific work, archive and ethnograph ethnographic work, I started then composing the piece Eight Works Against Racism and Poverty for Jazz Symphonic Orchestra. With this 40-piece orchestra, I presented the results of this artistic research in the form of two orchestra performances, which were documented on 1st and 2nd October last week. The concept behind the compositions links this work to important world events in 2020. Last year, the COVID virus became omnipresent and on 25th of May, the murder of George Floyd in USA triggered, triggered a series of protests against racism all around the world. As a Brazilian, I have seen uh, the structural social problems of racism and poverty close up. Problems that became evident as never before when COVID pandemic struck Brazil where 56% of the population is black. Historically, the poorest population with less access to education, healthcare, and as a result, the most affected group. I, a white male from middle class family, have always had the privileged position, and at this point of my life, I felt compelled to use this power uh, of this position and acknowledge my historical responsibility, calling attention to a subject that is still so present in the world, and even in Ulster, as we can see in the street outdoors and things like this. These thoughts inspired me to dedicate this large work uh, to the fight against racism and poverty, interconnected problems that still seem very far away from solved. Practically, this orchestra piece addressed the problem of poverty objectively. Since I, as composer, acknowledge the importance of the performance, the performers to the artistic results as co-composers. And in this sense, I, composer, shared the copyrights related to these recordings with the musicians. Artists should reflect on this question, especially when involving the performers in collaborative creative process, where the lines between composer, performer, improviser get blurred. Musically speaking, this work synthesized a discourse on hierarchy in large ensembles by exploring improvisation and collaborative process. As Christopher Small points out, 
the relationships created during a musical performance are more the ideal as imagined by the participants than the present reality. But only by imagining we can create the possibilities for real change. Creating a space of musical and social collaboration aimed ultimately to stimulate the musicians and myself to rethink our relationships with the world. Rethink one's relationship with the world involves recognizing one's mistakes and injustice in the history into which we are inserted, which can be the first step in changing the reality. Now, I return to initial questions related to acoustic particularities, physical disposition and recording, and suggest ideas in order to promote a good acoustic and visual communication in jazz symphonic orchestra context, contexts. Firstly, the wings. Instead of having the horn players organizing roles, I used semicircles in the previous case studies, and this was very effective and improved the sonic separation of the horn microphones, offered better visual contact and better acoustic understanding of the musical big picture. Involving improvisation and soloists from the string section made necessary to microphone the soloists closely. One possible solution can, can be seen in this Metropole Orchestra here, in this picture. The strings are protected by the position behind the orchestra and by the use of plexiglass on the right side. To microphone the string section, I used mainly two ways. All string players use clip microphone, as in the picture, or the use of several overhead microphones. In this situation, of course, the sound engineer has no control of the individual levels inside the, the section. In jazz symphonic orchestras, the leader in terms of pulse and tempo is usually the rhythm section rather than the conductor. Thus, both of them should be visible for the whole orchestra in the middle. Summarizing, in this jazz symphonic orchestra I did, Woodwinds and brass formed one semicircle on the opposite side. The string orchestra formed another semicircle, and conductor and rhythm section stayed in the middle. Now, we can watch one moment of the concert that beautifully summarizes what all these changes in disposition, monitoring, and rehearsal methods can provide us with. <laughs> During this week with the orchestra, I experienced interested, actively thinking musicians who brought this music to life, offering surprise to each performance. And I can say now that the invisible wall was not that big anymore, as we can watch here, where the bass player and the cellist talk to one another and exchange information about jazz pizzicato. Uh, they were actually secretly filmed by me, as you will realize. It's a climbing act. Anyway, when you fucking hit it with the storm. The search for a different relationship was the core of this artistic research, and the conductor's role comes into discussion only now because it was only at this last phase that I assumed the conductor's role exclusively. 
The conductor's task is basically to guide the musicians, and this task, this task has been accomplished in very different ways throughout history. 19th century, Romanticism gave birth to the profession of conducting, and the cult of the great conductor was consolidated in the 20th century, supported by radio broadcasts, recordings, music critics, and writers. As Nina Koivunen points out, conductors may be among the most undemocratic leaders in the world. They have the power to make interpretation decisions about all aspects of performance and are almost never questioned. Christopher Small also points out that the role of the conductor is not only to coordinate the orchestra, but it also reinforces the idea of the powerful autocrats who also impose their personalities at the orchestra. I would argue that this description of the conductor's work is already old-fashioned, but I believe it still resonates today in both jazz and classical cultures. During this research, the notation methods aimed to share the information of the scores with the musicians. The rehearsal strategies aimed to give more autonomy. And following the same line of reasoning, the conducting approach incorporated the idea of shared leadership. This concept emphasizes empowerment and teamwork. And as studies point out, it can influence team effective response, such as commitment, satisfaction, cohesiveness, as well as team behavioral response, such as effort, communication, and citizenship behaviors. Leadership in this context is viewed as a sequence of multidirectional reciprocal influence process among many individuals in different positions, resulting in knowledge created through the relational process. My artistic work throughout this project was focused on enabling shared leadership in a jazz symphonic context. To do so, it was necessary to reframe relationships, which also included a new way of thinking about the relationship between the conductor and the musicians. I suggest the creation of music can occur in a trusting open relationship where the conductor has a strong but humble conviction about the music, is responsive to the orchestra, respects and nurtures musicality without imposing their own views on the musicians. I do not claim that a conductor can exercise their function without any coercive authority. However, the conductor as a leader has several important roles in the shared, shared leadership process. The conductor should listen more and talk less, ask more questions and provide fewer answers, and encourage individual and team problem solving and decision making. The conductor should strive to replace conformity and dependence with initiative, creativity, and independence, and engage in the facilitating roles of selecting team members, developing team member skills, filling in for lacking skills, managing boundaries, and empowering team members. As we see, the conductor's function in a shared leadership context is extremely complex and presents many challenges posing concrete questions about implementation in practice, practical situations. During the analysis of case studies one and two, I detailed some of the approaches used to promote this environment. However, some more global elements have not yet been addressed, requiring awareness from the conductor's perspective and a set of working conditions. I would like to reflect on conditions that can be created by the attitude of the conductor to support shared leadership in large ensemble contexts. Figaro Adrier points out that contexts that involve improvisation depends on an open attitude on the part of the conductor and of the participants. Uh, the same open attitude can be observed as a requirement in shared leadership process, and I suggest that this is connected to a certain circumstance in the workflow. The rehearsal strategies developed at the beginning in, in this research were adapted almost by instinct during the process. And only through the analysis of interviews and rehearsal videos, I was able to realize the importance of workflow aspects. A proper atmosphere, peace, and serenity were pointed out by the interviewed musicians as ingredients for the success of the rehearsals and the development of collective work. I suggest some practical approach that conductors can take to promote the maintenance of this open attitude. If possible, rehearse all pieces of the planned program in every rehearsal. Between rehearsals, the musicians have time, consciously or not, 
time to reflect on what had been played and have time to internalize the music and come up with new input for next rehearsals. Besides the benefits of their learning process, performing the whole program in every rehearsal also supports the feeling of accomplishment. In short, a more meaningful experience for the musicians seems to be dependent on the conclusion of the work that's being currently done, translating it to the rehearsal process. When the performance of a piece begins, a whole different energy takes place, and a collective uh, objective as a group in the moment is to make music together. Ideally, this performance would go from begin to end, and playing the whole piece as often as possible is essential for the musicians to achieve an overview of the piece, have the feeling of accomplishment and a sense of progress. To avoid interruptions during the performance of the pieces during rehearsals, I suggest the conductor should communicate with the musicians during the performance. And here we watch an example from years ago. So this work began by asking how we can establish better communication between jazz and classical musicians. This main question led my artistic work to examine and explore the hierarchical organization that is present in large jazz ensembles. And as Christopher Small points out, relationships and traditions in making music are a matter of choice, and there is nothing inevitable about the arrangements we make. It's not ordained by nature, but is a social arrangement. To better understand these social arrangements, my research started in 2017 by discussing the establishment of the Jazz Symphonic Orchestra tradition in, the, in their historical contexts, where I used the two most active orchestras in the world as examples. In my artistic practice, I focused my exploration on two main strategies, creating mechanisms to change the social dynamic and exploring the incorporation of improvisation in this large ensemble context. Shared leadership proved to play a fundamental role in the process and dependent on a chain of requirements which had been pointed out and discussed now. Number one, an environment that supports a calm atmosphere which requires delicacy and efficiency on the part of the conductor. Two, besides a proper atmosphere, trust is an important component in shared leadership. Trust enables the, facilitates interaction, collaboration, risk-taking, experimentation, and all kinds of phenomena that are frequently associated with great performance. Shared leadership further requires effective communication, which was supported by the application of technology and through a readjustment of the traditional stage setting, as we saw. Involving jazz and classically trained musicians in this research contributed not only to comprehend the extent to which musicians coming from jazz and classical traditions can cooperate in large ensembles, it also showed that the time-worn institutional division between the disciplines no longer seems to reflect what the musicians of today seek in their musical lives, and that we should rethink how music is taught at universities and conservatories. A new model for music in a large jazz ensemble seems to demand a new curriculum that takes our reality of today into account. This research signals the need for institutions to think about their priorities and objectives for the future. How can a course in conducting, composition, or instrument be improved? What are the requirements for a new generation of conductors or jazz composers? This research suggested, suggests a possible direction. By adopting a different approach to working with large jazz orchestras, we can create a context which acknowledges the work of the individuals and results in other aesthetic ideals. An orchestra playing should be an inspiring example of people working together. The value of this work makes me believe that there should be many more jazz symphonic orchestra projects in the future and that more ener energy should be invested in the creation of ensembles fusing contrasting cultures. 
I happily finished this dissertation after four years of challenges and discoveries about music, about the world, and myself. And music in large ensemble contexts deals intimately with hierarchy and power relations and is a powerful tool to question the ways we relate to each other and orga organize our world. As I showed in this presentation, it can result in new aesthetical experience and change the way we relate to one another, creating relationships based on trust, collaboration, and serenity. To finish, I would like to dedicate this work to my mother, who was born in a very poor family in Brazil, and had the dream of learning how to read and write she not only succeeded in that, but she became professor and writer and finished her doctoral research in her 70s. She passed away in January 2021, this year, when I was finishing this dissertation, but I'm sure she would be very happy to be here today. Thank you.